I haven't seen Gorov. There you are. Good. What a relief. And is David here? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and just take your seats. Yeah, uh, they'll share one. I think that'll be okay. But you can put one of those on. Sorry. Nice to meet you. Nice to see Yeah. We'll I'm not going to talk. We'll <laughs> I'm good. Chris, why don't you come up and you'll be at the, the first one. We're excited to kick off this morning panel session. The, uh, the, the theme of the panel session is V to X connectivity. We want to know what's useful, what's hype, and what's not necessarily that practical. And we've got four excellent panelists to uh, who have experience in this area, who have also experience in, in the larger context of automated or electric vehicles. And Chris is the first of these. He's, uh, he's joined us. He was actually also instrumental in our, our bringing Sue Bai to the, to the conference. Uh, Chris has uh, a wonderful Forbes article written about him that I encourage you to read, saying that he's the inventor of important technology that Tesla's been using. He's been in this space for a long time, worked at GM before he came over to Qualcomm. I'll let him finish the introduction and uh, give us an introductory remarks for, his, uh, for the panel session. Thank you, Todd. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as my title of my presentation uh, explains, I'm going to be talking about wireless solutions for future mobility, and that's a little bit broader than just wireless communications. I also want to talk about wireless power transfer, which is particularly relevant for electric vehicles. So you've seen this chart several times already, so I don't, I don't think I need to go over this again. But as we look at future mobility needs, the societal objectives are on the left-hand side, and you can see that there isn't a single silver bullet here that solves all the problems. That's why there is a lot of investment into automated, connected, electrified, and shared vehicles, you know, the four aces. Um, basically, none of them solve all of the problems facing mobility needs in the future, especially in dense urban environments. And I would put a, an asterisk on this because um, the asterisk is a lot of this can be derailed by human nature. So as we look at the benefits of automation, connectivity, and electrification from a societal perspective, we have to be cognizant of unintended consequences that might drive adverse effects. And that means that we need to think a lot also about public policy in this issue as well. As Sue mentioned before, uh, we've been working with uh, Honda uh, on vehicle-to-pedestrian communications because Qualcomm is uh, uniquely positioned, really, to work on both the vehicle side and the, the smartphone side. And I, I won't uh, dwell on this because she gave a very interesting um, video presentation on this. Suffice to say, and you've seen this, this slide already, we believe that connectivity fusion as well as sensor fusion is needed. Uh, one of the questions earlier today was, um, when we get to level four or level five vehicles that are fully autonomous, is there a need for connectivity? And I would argue there is, because I don't think anybody is making the claim that a fully autonomous vehicle will never crash. Um, it's just impossible to make that claim of, with 100% guarantee. And so I think you always need um, as much help as possible um, to, to provide as much robustness as you can in all environmental circumstances. And also, we shouldn't just think of a, the, um, connectivity as a, as a support for collision avoidance capability. As uh, one of the slides earlier mentioned, it, it's also about improving traffic flow. So even if you have a, a bunch of autonomous vehicles driving by themselves, um, traffic flow could be improved significantly if, that, if those vehicles can be coordinated through coordinated ACC systems, uh, which rely on connectivity. So there are definitely some traffic benefits as well as safety benefits by fusing connectivity and sensing together. Qualcomm has a whole host of technologies that we have developed for the smartphone uh, system which can be applied with some modifications to the uh, automobile use case. And then there are some other technologies like wireless EV charging which we see as being particularly relevant for automotive. This is a, a slide that really just shows 
that we see a changing ecosystem. The, on the left-hand side, you see the traditional uh, supply chain in the automotive industry with the automaker at the top of the supply chain um, directing requirements to the tier ones and down the food chain, so to speak. We see, we see that future vehicles that are far more like smartphones on wheels or computer on wheels will require a different business model, a different supply chain. And we're excited to be part of that future, working together with the um, auto industry to develop the vehicles of the future. So I just want to talk about wireless charging for electric vehicles. Some of you may, may know about this. It's different from the old inductive paddle that was used in the EV1, where you had millimeter clearances. This is technology that can transfer power, kilowatts of power, across um, gaps of um, 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters, the typical gap you might see underneath a car or an SUV. So it's, to a lot of people, it's magic. In fact, when I joined Qualcomm four years ago from GM, a lot of the people from GM just didn't believe it was possible to do this wireless power transfer. But it is, and we recently uh, got a, a contract from Mercedes-Benz, which was uh, announced just the other day. But Qualcomm's approach to wireless charging is very comprehensive, and it's, it's basically providing uh, reference designs and licensing of technology to tier one suppliers who can then uh, create solutions for the automakers uh, with a wireless charging pad. The idea being that you would be able to buy an electric vehicle in the near future and tick a box uh, to buy the option for wireless charging. So when you come home at night, um, instead of having to plug the car in uh, and, re and remembering to remove the plug when you want to leave, you can just drive over a pad into your garage and charge automatically. Some of these solutions that we have here are related to the smartphone. For example, electromagnetic compliance is something that uh, was a concern, still is uh, to some degree, with um, handheld devices. And we've developed a lot of capability in Qualcomm, a lot of um, facilities and expertise to address that issue, which is being redeployed for wireless charging. So the idea being that even when this vehicle is charging at full power, which can be several kilowatts of power, you could be able to walk by the side of the vehicle or even sit inside the vehicle with a pacemaker and not be affected by adverse electromagnetic fields. It has to be extremely safe. We also have systems in place for detecting objects and shutting the system down so that the system doesn't overheat. Um, so we, we take safety extremely uh, seriously, and that's going to be a required uh, solution for wireless charging of electric vehicles. Now I want to just show a short video showing you how the system is deployed. We retrofitted a Honda Accord plug-in hybrid electric vehicle with wireless charging. accident avoidance technology. If you're familiar with electric car charging today, you know that you have to plug the car in and wait for it to charge. Well, in the future, this will be automatic. All you do is roll the car over a charging pad and the vehicle will begin charging automatically. So we can demonstrate that here today. We have a charging pad on the ground. We have a driver that's going to drive that vehicle right over the charging pad and you'll see an alignment circle fill up and show that he's aligned over the pad. When he's fully aligned, he stops the car and he starts the charging process. So this car will charge completely wirelessly, completely automatically at the same rate as conductive charging. In our case, this is about 3.3 kilowatts of charge. On the screen here in a few moments, you'll see the car come up to speed at the charging rate at 3.3 kilowatts. All right, the vehicle is charging at 3.3 kilowatts now, the same rate as a conductive charger. People often ask me, what about my family cat? What if the cat falls underneath the vehicle while the vehicle's charging? Is that okay? Well, we have a safety system just for that occasion. We call it living object protection. I'm going to demonstrate that now. As I walk over to the vehicle, I'll pretend that I'm going under the vehicle and the system will shut off. So as you see, the living object protection system detected that I was attempting to get under the vehicle and shut all the power off, so it's a safe system. And next we'll be done. So it seems like magic, um, but it's actually going to be commercially available in 2018 on Mercedes-Benz S550 plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So, and then we expect other OEMs, starting probably with the luxury brands, uh, rolling this out as a feature because it's a luxury feature initially, but we think that as people get used to not plugging in and not having to remember to remove the plug, it, it will be adopted very easily. 
So in summary, this is our future of mobility, our vision for it. It's vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to bicyclists, vehicle to pedestrian communications. I should point out, though, when we talk about vehicle to infrastructure communications, to some extent it might also be vehicle to cloud back to infrastructure um, without necessarily being directly between the vehicle and the infrastructure. Because as you know, infrastructure rollout is, um, is sometimes challenged from a budget perspective. But if you can tap into the data in a, in a traffic control center, for example, you can get that signal phase and timing information. So it might be vehicle to cloud to infrastructure when we think about vehicle to infrastructure in the future. So thank you very much. Gaurav, did you have slides? Yeah. Okay. There will at the end. Yeah. Sorry about that. So. Yeah, good question. It's the same efficiency, give or take, as a conductive charging. So it's about 90% efficient uh, from wall to uh, battery. And we think that in the future, it could be even more efficient than that. And from a vehicle perspective, the long-term vision is that this will allow you to reduce the size of the battery, uh, which would mean that the vehicle itself becomes more energy efficient. So we, we think from an efficiency perspective, there's a significant benefit uh, in the long run. In the near term, uh, some of the regulators in, in Europe and elsewhere are concerned that when they give credits for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, they assume that those vehicles are driving on electric power as much as possible. Now, you know that when you uh, drop off a car at a, ch uh, at a parking spot, you might forget to plug in, especially if it's just for a five-minute hop into a, a supermarket or whatever. And so uh, often um, vehicles that have to be plugged in don't uh, use the battery as much as they possibly can do. The vision for wireless charging is that every time you park the car, it will charge wirelessly and therefore be running on electric power as much as possible. And I forgot to mention that the big enabler, or not a big enabler, but a big benefit of wireless charging comes when you have autonomous vehicles and robo-taxis. So you say the efficiency is the same as a conductive charge. That does sound like magic to me. <laughs> well, the efficiency across the gap, I said pretty much the same. It's about 99% as efficient mm -hmm. as the uh, conductive charging system. And Potentially, it could be better efficiency in the long run in terms of power electronics optimization. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Gaurav is our next uh, speaker, or our next panelist. He comes from Toyota, the Info Technology Center, and has been uh, a presence at TWS at least the last two years. Go ahead, Gaurav. Yep. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Gaurav Bansal, and, and I'm glad to be uh, here participating in this panel on V2X connectivity. And I'll take a little bit different take from what the title of the panel suggests and, uh, and talk about like as a large OEM, uh, how we are sh uh, seeing that the role V2X can play in automated driving, what are some of the challenges and how we're trying to uh, address it. So uh, every major OEM and many other companies uh, are working on automated driving. Uh, here there are a couple of uh, models that, uh, or a couple of automated uh, driving designs that we have announced both for highway automated driving and urban automated driving. And what lies uh, in the heart of this are various sensors. Uh, as, as you are hearing throughout the day, uh, the, the, some of the most important sensors are GPS, IMU, cameras, radars, lidars, high definition map, and, uh, and connectivity to cloud. And what we have done in our research is we're looking into four main functionalities uh, that automated driving sensors provide. Uh, those are namely mapping, localization, perception, and path planning. And then we are trying to uh, grade them on these four performance criteria in the first row based on the sensor stack uh, in the previous slide. So we're looking into what kind of accuracy or the range uh, we can provide, uh, how robust they are to bad weather, what are the cost implications, and then can they operate in non-line of sight scenario. And what we find as like some of the main challenges using the current sensor stack is for a large OEM, it's not easy to build a high definition map for all the roadways across United States. We are not a mapping or a software company. It will take us some time to get there. And even when we have that database, uh, these maps can change on an hourly or daily basis. And so some, this would limit uh, the, the kind of the mapping software that a car can rely on. Similarly on localization, as you would see here, I've divided into two rows. The first row is where we're not using a sensor like LiDAR for doing localization. And then when we know there are challenges uh, in localizing the car in scenarios like urban canyon. 
If we add LIDARs, localization can be improved, but then LIDARs are not that robust in bad weather scenario, uh, like rain, snow, and then they, it could be an expensive sensor. So if we want to sell a 15,000, 20,000 Toyota Corolla, we might not be able to deploy a, a LIDAR uh, on it. F regarding perception, uh, we know the, the, the existing sensor stack has a limited range, 50 to 80 meters. It does not work that well in the bad weather scenarios, like in rain and snow. And then uh, we know about a recent fatal crash uh, that Tesla had. And perhaps uh, the reason that it happened was that camera was not able to detect this white truck in bright sunlight. Then uh, the challenges in path planning, we know it's hard for automated uh, cars to be able to do merging. Uh, there, uh, when uh, we have a bunch of research vehicles in Bay Area uh, dri uh, driving in an autonomous way, but their speed is capped to 25 miles an hour. This is done uh, to keep a defensive driving because the car is not able to see what might be coming from a perpendicular street. And, uh, and another example is platooning. Uh, which would, uh, could be the key uh, for uh, improving the fuel efficiency, and it cannot be done uh, with using any of the sensor stack. So we believe there are a lot of challenges that exist for various scenarios and various models in automated driving. And now, what can happen if we add connected intelligence to uh, our automated driving sensor stack. And uh, here by connected intelligence, uh, this concept we mean low latency uh, V2X communication. So for mapping, mapping can be improved. If there is a car, you know, 100 meters, 200 meters away from me, that's telling me through its sensor data what the road geometry is. I can use it to build a real-time map or correct error on an existing map that I might have. It could be used to improve localization because I can not only use my own GPS receiver, but I can leverage the GPS receivers of the neighboring vehicles. And then using the ranging sensor, I can get another estimate on my position. Perception can be improved. We know V2X, it depends on which frequency we are operating in. In 5.9, it can uh, go up to 300, 400 meters. Uh, we know RF propagates well in bad weather scenarios, rain, snow. Uh, and uh, any of the bright sunlight. It does not have any of these challenges. And regarding path planning, uh, we think low latency communications can help enabling merging, platooning, and uh, efficient speed while driving in uh, around intersections in urban, suburban scenarios. So we think uh, connected intelligence might be a key in achieving this level four, level five autonomous driving uh, where uh, we can uh, we can work uh, we can work drive autonomously in all scenarios and 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 for even for a cheaper uh, car, but then uh, now what's the catch? What is the challenge in V2X? We know it can take uh, significant numbers to achieve uh, significant years to achieve a large amount of V2X deployment, and we are thinking of some of the strategies on how to address this challenge. So we want to learn from what we have done in DSRC safety communication, something that, that Sue talked about in her, in her talk. And uh, also think of uh, cooperative automated driving in a similar fashion as cooperative adaptive cruise control. So adaptive cruise control uh, is available in many of the vehicles that are being sold uh, in US and elsewhere. But Toyota in Japan, uh, we have large market share. We have started rolling out DSRC from late last year. And we have also started rolling out the CACC application, which uh, provides a, a, a significant improvement in the motion profile. So we want to think of cooperative automated driving in a way that we first deploy automated driving applications without cooperation. And that might mean that we need to have defensive slow speeds uh, in merging non-line of sight operation, uh, limited operation in bad weather conditions, and then tolerance for high braking. And as more V2X data is available, all these things uh, can be improved. And uh, we also realized that in the United States, there are a lot of OEMs, and, and no one has a significant enough uh, market share. So that might require some kind of intra-OEM memorandum of understanding, or perhaps even a government mandate uh, for being able to share this V2X data for automated driving applications. And kind of uh, finally, uh, I just want to uh, touch on the possible timeline. And, and I don't want you to kind of jump from your seats. Uh, these are not uh, any timelines coming from 
from corporate. Uh, this is something that we are looking into our research. So we have identified three main years, 2020, 2025, 2030. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, as in, in the earlier talk, uh, we are all waiting for a government mandate on DSRC in the United States. So these are the penetration uh, values for these three years uh, for DSRC uh, if a mandate does come. And then we are also expecting that a millimeter wave deployment might happen some, somewhere around, uh, somewhere between 2020 to 2025 uh, that can enable high data rate applications. And the role that cooperative automated driving can play in these three years, in 2020 it'll be very limited because my uh, penetration level is only 3%. But in 2030, when I can have 60 to 70 percent V2X deployment, DSRC based, and, and, in, uh, and uh, perhaps significant number of cars that also have millimeter wave communications, uh, then we think uh, that the true potential of cooperation might be realized, and, and it could be the key for us to achieve level four, level five autonomous driving. So thank you. Do we have any quick questions for Gaurav while he takes his seat? And Jeff, you wanna come up? Go ahead and shout it out, Jeff. So, yeah, so, I mean, definitely, <laughs> I mean, that's a fair question, but automotive works on a very different timelines than kind of a smartphone industry. And, uh, and, and these numbers are coming from that the deployment will start in 2020. We're not deploying uh, after a government mandate comes. Uh, well, we have only, we only have 3% market. Why don't we do it right? Like engineer a modern system and then deploy that. Why are we deploying it in 1999? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, like, because uh, there is work going on in, like, LTE, for example, right now in LTE V2X. But f the way automotive industry works is once, uh, like, you know, LTE V2X, like, the standard is out or the first chipset is out, that does not mean we can deploy it. It requires years of uh, testing, experiments. We have done that for DSRC. And, and, and definitely that, that delay is not good, but, but even going through, a, uh, through a, like, a different path, uh, that might not necessarily speed up things. Uh, Robert? Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. If just one OEM does it, it's going to be like, you know, in some ways, they're going to get least benefits. You, the market uh, provides you more benefits uh, when you are in some ways last to go. Uh, and that's why all the OEMs kind of, you know, many years ago decided that we're going to wait for a government mandate. But I just want to mention this, that in Japan, because there we have 40 to 50 percent market share, we have started deploying from late last year. So there we kind of, you know, walking the walk, uh, not just the top. Yeah. Let's turn it over to, to, to Jeff Waters. He's from NXP and looks at trusted computing. Uh, I invited him on this panel because we have some questions about security in, in, uh, in relation to V to X, V to V. So uh, go ahead and take it away. Thanks. Um, so we've heard a lot about Qualcomm. Uh, just in case uh, an, an introduction is necessary, I want to tell you a little bit about NXP <clears throat> and uh, what, we, what we know about automotive. So. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the sensors. Uh, we actually produce a lot of the sensors. We're particularly strong in radar. Uh, v to X communication, we're, we're, we're totally on board. Just, just start putting it in because we make those V to X modules. Get busy. Uh, we also produce a lot of the, the processors, uh, uh, devices that I would call sensor domain processors that do fusion at, uh, at for, for like a particular type of sensor. And then also we have, uh, we have processors, powerful processors that can be used in more of a central fusion or central brain role. And uh, e-cockpit infotainment uh, displays, that, that's also a pretty big area for us. Um, uh, automotive is 40% of the company, uh, and that combined company, NXP Original plus Freescale, which is the part that I, I come from, um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a $10 billion company. 
Oh. There we go. Uh, specifically, the part of the company I'm from is uh, a, a group called Digital Networking, uh, which is sort of gives you another another side of this. We've got the automotive experience, but we're also pretty experienced in, in wireless communication, uh, as well as networking, enterprise, uh, security appliances. Um, really, our, our products kind of live in the infrastructure at what's, what's increasingly referred to, to as the cloud edge. Um, so that, that's what uh, we're, we're implying over there. But there's also this other very interesting aspect to, uh, to, to the use of our high performance processors, and that's actually in the military and aerospace realm. So uh, those of you who flew here or are flying back somewhere, our, our chips are, are helping to run that plane. So uh, we're already in autonomous vehicles. We're just doing it at 30,000 feet. So bottom line, NXP understands the V and the I. We're, we're in the vehicle side, we're in the infrastructure side. Um, the things that you need to do, sense, think, act, and communicate, those activities are occurring in both sides. Um, if you take the example of, of the connected and automated vehicle, as well as something like the intelligent traffic intersection, you're gonna see very similar types of sensors, very si similar types of capabilities. The car is moving through its environment, so it's all about path planning for that car. Uh, the intersection is trying to schedule as many vehicles as possible through the intersection, kind of plan, not, not actually controlling them, but telling them what they need to do to safely uh, transit the intersection without hitting each other. Now, bringing this back a little bit more to, to, uh, to, to V to X, or the, the messaging standard, at least the, the one that's, uh, that's in DSRC, um, and I'll, I'll mention security a little bit. I'm just standing, I'm bracing myself for the questions on that topic. Uh, essentially, the DSRC, you've got the wireless component, which is the 802.11p down at the bottom. That's the 5.9 gigahertz. Uh, above that, depending on whether you're in Europe or the US, you're going to have similar things going on. But of course, because we're two different geographies, we've got to call everything by entirely different names. So over in Europe, it's ITS-G5. In the US, it's WAVE. Uh, in Europe, they call them cooperative assist messages. In the US, they're basic safety messages. They're essentially the same thing. These are, these are messages that are being sent from vehicles to vehicles, from infrastructure to vehicles, from vehicles to infrastructure that are, that are conveying some kind of information that is either going to improve road safety or traffic efficiency. Those are the two big uh, purposes of, of sending these things out. You could obviously also use these for, you know, historical roadside marker messages if you so choose. Um, but, but really it's, it's about short messages uh, signed with, uh, with digital signatures attached to each one for security. So short, high security messages that are, that are broadcast and every receiver of those messages has the means to authenticate that message, know that it's, know that it's good, and then decide what they do with that information. Ultimately, um, the, the safety of the message uh, is, is going to come from um, your, your ability to correlate it with other information. Uh, I, I, I don't think even the, the, the biggest V to X advocate, V to V advocate would say, you know, if the car in front of you sends out an emergency brake message, that you should slam on your brakes as hard as possible too, unless your radar or cameras kind of correlates that that information, because uh, you know this is this is just going to be a, a very ripe area. The bad guys are going to want to uh, to, to hack this system. They're going to want to spoof messages. They're going to want to send out bogus messages that say, you know, I'm a tra I'm the next traffic light that you're approaching, and it's green. You're cool. Just go. Speed up even. You know, if, if, that's, if that's a spoofed traffic light, if that's spoofed uh, infrastructure, and you follow that information and it's actually red, uh, that, that could lead to a, a, a very, you know, that could lead to fatal collisions. I mean, at, if, what else would you go after in a cyber war? You know, this, is, this is the sort of stuff that you would absolutely target. So security will be quite critical to it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the tools are in the protocol, the tools are in the messages to, to know that you're getting a good message and there's the basis of knowing that the system that sent the message hasn't been compromised. 
but the implementations have got to be careful about how they actually act on that information. You, nothing, should be, nothing should be taken on blind faith. So that's what I've got. And you can go ahead and pepper him with a few questions while we get set up with David, if you'd like. Way back here. Mm -hmm. So, what's your general... Uh, and I've got my timer shut. Um, I, I don't know that there's any uh, computer architecture dictated by any of this. So it, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's, it, it's the results that will count. Um, people are, are trying to find the best architectures based on what meets the performance, but there's, there's so many system partitioning trade-offs that are still being made in all these systems that uh, I, I, I don't think there's, there, this, this is wide open as far as I'm concerned. We'll save the rest of the questions for the panel portion of the session. Uh, David Brenner is welcome to, to, to TWS today. He's the Director of Wireless Solutions at uh, uh, Business Development at Intel and was also a great facilitator for us right. getting another speaker from Intel for this afternoon. David? Good morning and thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to participate in this wonderful uh, annual event. Um, so as Todd said, I am from Intel Corporation, but I'm actually here representing the Open Connectivity Foundation. And I would to spend a few minutes uh, giving you some background on that because I think uh, when you see what we're trying to do across the industry, it has an important role not only for automotive, uh, but for other IoT use cases that involve device to device and that touch on a variety of the communications infrastructures. Uh, Chris, I was very intrigued when I saw the wireless charging mat. I thought that uh, I'd finally have an excuse to put that big screen in my garage. <laughs> then I realized I have to buy a high-end Mercedes to go along with it, so I don't think my wife's going to go for that. I have to say, we're all getting bombarded with messages about massive connectivity, you know, the, the, the links we've been looking at and talking about this morning for the automotive industry and for uh, vehicles uh, as well as, as infrastructure. Uh, certainly presents a huge opportunity and obviously uh, we as, as uh, product companies as well as you as researchers and academics are, are obviously investing in a big way to try to make this happen. And specifically, you know, I didn't tell where we build everything from the radios that touch the edge all the way to the uh, high-end data center computing systems that will do these analytics and, uh, and help drive some of these solutions. Um, we appreciated that while the word IoT and the, the IoT verticals uh, that we're pursuing are a big opportunity, in fact, much larger potentially than, uh, you know, than smartphones. And I think, you know, Sanjeev said this morning, whatever numbers you believe, they're still going to be very big, okay? So if it's 40 billion or 20 billion or 5 billion, it's still a hell of a lot of devices. Um, so uh, with that, though, we, uh, as, as an investor in standards at Intel and with our partners and the community at large, want to ensure the pursuit of that big target, whatever it will be, uh, needs to be based on standards. Okay? And, and obviously there's standards going on. We've heard about the work in SAE, um, et cetera. But uh, if we just look uh, across the board, how things like the Wi-Fi uh, IEEE uh, 802.11 and the Wi-Fi Alliance took a basic radio technology and now it's all the way into DSRC, for example, okay? It's, it's everywhere, it's pervasive. That was driven by the fact that we had an industry standard and cooperation across the community of providers and, and competitors. And while we're talking about communications, uh, I've heard quotes that Hardware without software is just a generation of heat. Um, we need code, we need solutions, and we need to ensure uh, that we can help companies, not only that are deeply vested in this, but who want to enter into this space. I'm sure some of you uh, researchers here who want to maybe start up your own company, you got to move fast, you got to be nimble. 
And the opportunity to build on and leverage open source to bootstrap those solutions, including in the automotive space, uh, is a tremendous one. And even if we look at the web and what W3C has done, and just how well connected the world at large is as a result of the standards that they've driven. So in 2014, two and a half years ago, Intel along with industry leaders including Samsung, Dell, Cisco, GE and others, looking at this problem and this need of a standard for IoT, got together and we formed an organization to help drive specifically a solution in and around connectivity between devices above the radio layer. Okay. We want to build on and leverage existing standards and new standards, but also provide, a, a, if you will, a middleware abstraction layer that can allow devices to understand each other, what their capabilities are, and how they can connect to each other. And we want to make sure that we can make this technology available to the community at large. So we embarked on three specific missions under the OCF umbrella. First, to have an actual documented specification. This is something that folks that are building stacks and services can go to. This is something that can be used for not only interoperability, but also any kind of formal certification test. Second, we wanted to make sure that there's an open source capability and availability for developers to actually implement this specification in their products and services. And then finally, the third leg, if you will, of the chair, is to actually drive a certification process, very similar to what many of us have seen and used today, whether it's uh, you know, uh, plug fest to Wi-Fi uh, certification, Bluetooth, et cetera. Do the same thing for the OCF specification. Now, as I mentioned, the, the work we want to do here is to build on and not replace uh, industry standards. We don't want to create yet another mousetrap. Rather, what we want to do is ensure this common capability for device-to-device -device discovery, resource exchange and models interaction, and a security layer, whether you're sitting on a BLE node or you're in a vehicle as some type of sensor, maybe that's communicating back to your house or to other cars. We also wanted to uh, make sure that this is not just a smart home solution, but rather can scale across a variety of different verticals uh, including automotive and in fact uh, I'm chair of the liaison group for OCF and uh, we have a number of very strong liaison partners most recently uh, we demonstrated OCF interoperating with Geneva in the automotive space in a connected car to connected home um, uh, scenarios and uh, doing the same in others like like personal health uh, and industrial just to give you a, a snapshot of where we are we formed in, in August of 2014, as I mentioned. At the end of last year, we actually um, acquired Universal Plug and Play. As you know, they're very large in the, in the smart home and with media, and they were embarking down a IoT path. We realized that the same companies were involved, a lot of the same technologies could play for the connected home uh, and for IoT at large. So we basically acquired and folded in their assets, their intellectual property, and also, um, a very wonderful tool called One Iota, which is now allowing us to build a repository, common repository, uh, for data models and interaction that anybody can build to and publish with. Um, and then in, uh, in uh, February of this year, uh, Qualcomm and Microsoft and Electrolux joined with the, uh, the team. And then I have to say I'm pleased to uh, share with you today uh, an announcement that came out last week and was formally uh, agreed to by the members that the Allstein Alliance, previously an open standards IoT organization driven by Qualcomm and Microsoft and others, have formally merged with the Open Connectivity Foundation. So as of this week, we are one organization with one common mission and charter to drive this IoT capability. And uh, this now makes our membership over 400 total, and that includes everybody from semi semiconductor manufacturers to systems integrators to back-end providers, you know, the IBMs of the world, the Cisco's, GE Digital, all members of this common community. <laughs> I was warned I had to uh, stay to seven minutes. <laughs> that was his timer going off. Perfect timing. Thanks, David. 
We'll go now to the uh, panel portion of the panel session. And I'll be roving around with a microphone, as will Constantine. We'll be happy to take your questions. You can also just shout them out from where you are if you find that's more comfortable. And let's go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, query our panelists on, on the topic of V to X, V to V, V to I. Any first questioners? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Well, uh, I, I think the systems have got to be pretty self-contained. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, to, to points that were made earlier about, you know, I don't want to go jogging with my cell phone just to avoid being hit. The, these systems have got to work if a naked toddler runs out into the road. So you can't count on cooperative emitting, uh, um, emitting uh, targets to, to, to tell you that they're there. And you have to have some provision to deal with the fact that some of those targets might even be false malicious targets. So, so really, the, the, there is a strong need for, for self-contained sensors to keep you from hitting things. V to X comes in, in by, by smoothing things out, because al although you, you survive better if you're paranoid, you flourish if you cooperate. So there, uh, I, I would not. I would not make any single uh, V to X communication a, a, a necessary part of my three second safety envelope, but you, you pan out a little bit and yes, it's absolutely there. And it'll, it'll keep you from spilling your coffee as, uh, as your automated car takes you to work. So Jeff, is your claim that you'd like to have a minimum level of service, uh, a minimum performance out of your vehicle in a self-contained way, in a, a truly autonomous way that, uh, that can, can be connected with safety of life performance objectives. And then if you layer on top of that, V to X, you might improve by another fact or order of magnitude, but you're still going to say, I'm good enough even without connectivity. I'm safe enough without talking to any other vehicles. Is, is, is that your position? Yes, that, that, that's essentially it. And I, I think, you know, the way that uh, these things are gonna roll out with, uh, with the with the early deployments of uh, truly autonomous vehicles being transportation, uh, transportation as a service where you've got effectively a six passenger electric golf cart with, uh, with sides to keep the rain out, driving around Austin, putting pedicabs out of work, um, low speed stops on a dime. Those systems are gonna be relying on their local sensors, uh, onboard sensors. There, there, there won't be any infrastructure of merit for them to talk to. So that's how it's, I, I think that's how it'll start out. And then as you, you expand the number of situations where these, where these vehicles can go into, um, and you start getting infrastructure like traffic lights that can, that, that can communicate with them and say, oh, here comes one of those uh, robo cabs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him, I'm gonna tell him it's okay to go through the intersection. Let's keep these, let's keep these cars moving. Um, that, that's where the, where the V to X will start having more and more value. Incentives, connectivity. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I think we, even the Google autonomous vehicle, is, it's not a hermetically sealed you know, cocoon. It's uh, vulnerable to cyber attack like most cars are on the road today um, that aren't autonomous. So I think we have to realize that any way you connect a vehicle, and even the Google system has to be connected to get downloads for maps and has to be... Uh, get GPS fixes and so forth. So there is this uh, inherent uh, vulnerability for, with any vehicle that has to be addressed. But we're talking about real-time versus yes. one-time. Right? Before you leave, you download your maps, you're fine for the next one hour. As opposed to, I need my update in the next second, otherwise I'm doomed kind of scenario, right? Yeah, I think, I think the V2V security, um, the, the low-latency security is a real 
um, challenge and a real hot topic that needs to be solved um, you know, to prevent bad actors from uh, sending out bad information that can't be trusted. So it's a real, really legitimate issue that needs to be solved. But I think the idea of vehicles that can communicate with each other through the infrastructure or through the cloud provides a lot of value. And you have to rely on the sensors ultimately to verify that information. If I can just add to this, uh, so actually automotive industry, like you know, for, for DSRC, V2V, V2I, we have done a lot of work on security already. There is a standard uh, 1609 and every message that you are transmitting, almost half of the overhead is the security certificate. And so first thing that you know, when we are deploying these systems would be that we would try to make them as safe as possible. Uh, we realize it might not be 100%, but it's gonna be like, you know, pretty safe. And the second thing I think what's important to keep in mind here is that it'll totally depend on what kind of application you're using the V2X data for. If V2X data is telling me that, you know, 150 meters uh, from the Ego vehicle, some truck suddenly braked, then that's not the information I can get from any other sensor, and it's gonna be useful for me. Similarly, if someone is coming from a perpendicular street, uh, and, and perhaps uh, like the systems that we will deploy eventually, they could be built that, you know, if you are making a driving decision where you could run into uh, you know, the car in front of you, then that kind of driving decision would have to be verified you know, by my other onboard sensors. But it's kind of, you know, for applications like it's giving me a warning or I'm using it to build a map uh, and, and knowing that I have a pretty high confidence in the system, uh, then V2X uh, would, would be a good solution for it. Is that Chandra up there? Yeah. Uh, okay. If I can comment on this, uh, I'm not an expert on V2V or V2X security. We have plenty of experts over here. But from a transportation standpoint, I think a legitimate argument can be made that there are certain safety critical situations where uh, just being self-contained in the form of a Google card is not going to be adequate. Uh, one example would be, and something we have been uh, working on with TechStart, um, would be the overtaking maneuver on rural roads. When you have just one lane in each direction, the basic geographic footprint of just being self-contained and trying to keep yourself safe through simply uh, autonomous kinds of sensors would not be adequate in the context of giving you uh, enough cushion to either abort your maneuver or complete it safely because you know an oncoming vehicle could be a mile away or even further than that and your self-contained systems will simply not be able to uh, sense uh, at, at those kinds of distances and uh, before it senses it's already too late. The two vehicles are at such a collision rate of uh, um, you know, convergence that it wouldn't be adequate. Communications, V to X, in those kinds of situations would be very, very beneficial. Any comments, guys? I agree. <laughs> so so go, going, going back to the panel topic, which is V to X, and not specifically tying it to uh, autonomous versus driver assistance systems, you know, my personal uh, position is that Vita X that can supplement the current driving conditions that drivers today face, certainly in the U.S. and I'm sure around the world, has immediate and significant net social uh, and safety value. Now, a personal experience of mine, I wish I had DSRC on my Honda motorcycle. Uh, I was just sitting, uh, waiting for the red light to change to green, and I got plowed into by a SUV from the back. Okay, um, it turns out the driver was texting. Uh, I would have greatly appreciated uh, the driver getting uh, an alert that I was there because she said she didn't see me. I said you didn't see me because you were looking at your phone, but uh, had an alert like you have demoed, uh, been available, one, the light is red. Even if I wasn't there, the light is red that extra information can have tremendous benefit. I was driving from Dallas yesterday and I witnessed a ladder fly out of a pickup truck at 75 miles an hour. Having that information available, not only immediately to the cars behind it, but then also the opportunity to tie it into non v x systems, perhaps through a social network like Waze that says, there's an object in the road. Oh, by the way, I didn't have to pick up my phone and enter it into Waze. VTX capabilities give me the opportunity to make current driving 
safer. And I can almost guarantee you that the net value of starting there, even before automation, will be significant. For driver assistance. Yeah. Got a question questions? up here that, that's been uh, okay. sure. in the... Uh, hi, so uh, my question is really about, like a broad question about uh, vehicles exchanging d sensor data uh, that was brought up earlier. And the question really is that, like, as we just saw, like with DSRC, uh, there is delay in deployment because automakers are just wanting to have maximum profit, right? So uh, even with sensor data, like, you know, maybe my company invests, like, a lot of money making really good sensors, right? And I know that someone else's company the company's sensors are not so good. Like, would, would automakers be willing to share their, like, maybe higher quality sensors data with, with other vehicles, which they know are probably not as, as good as their sensors? Does a Ford Fiesta get the <laughs> sensing data from a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> and if it does, is it, is it a free rider? Any comments? So, so if, if I can comment on it. So first, uh, I don't know if we are waiting for the DSRC deployment because, because we are trying to make money. Uh, I would certainly not agree with that. Uh, but, uh, and, and kind of as we were touching earlier, it's, it's more like a chicken and egg problem. You get the best benefit when everyone goes together. And that's why we you know, took this model that we'll get a government mandate. And, and, and the governments work on a different timelines. Uh, that's, that's what's causing the delay. But now the question about the, about the sensor, different kind of sensors, that's a very valid question. And even for one OEM like us, my Lexus in 2025 could have very different sensors and the software than a Corolla in 2022. Different models, different years. And, and, and that is why there could be two things uh, that could be done. One is like what SAE has done right now for DSRC basic safety message that there might be some minimum performance requirements that the sensor has to satisfy before you put that message over the air. And you also uh, kind of you know, uh, add the error statistics that your sensor might have. That's one way to do it. Second is something uh, that uh, millimeter wave, uh, uh, the, the collaboration that, that we have with Robert Heath here, is using millimeter wave, you would be able to share huge amount of data. So I can just share my Corolla in 2020, uh, you know, 2022 Corolla can just share this raw data, and then Lexus will figure out what to do with it. Uh, that'll be a second approach uh, to try to uh, address that challenge. Uh, I think I, I, I wish uh, I wish you'd given us hype and good or whatever, you know, red and green signs, and and for things like this, we could all just vote as to what it is. <laughs> Go ahead, the, the weigh sharing, in, Jeff. This Let sharing sensor data thing seems really absurd to me. I, okay. I, I can, I'll call that one hype. Why would you do that? And what are, what are the motivations? I mean, you, sharing information is one thing, but, but streaming raw I'm going to hand data. the microphone to, to Robert, and he's going to uh, lay down a few of the motivations. <laughs> because you can. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the compelling need. Okay. <laughs> Just, just as a comment, I don't literally mean that the voltage signals coming off of all sensors are sampled and shipped everywhere. There's some processing, but I think the point is, do you want to apply all of the decision making and send the decisions, or do you want to have something that's less processed? And I feel like as the technology is going to evolve very quickly, and that Lexus is going to have um, a better processing engine on it, why not let it process that data? Why rely on the older cars with the crappier sensor <laughs> technologies decision? So I feel like we well, need something in the yeah, middle. Maybe the, we don't need the raw the, data, the, but we need the, something. The crappier car in front if, isn't making a decision for the better car. It's just sharing information. There is a vulnerable road user up ahead. Do you, if, do you, if, if the crappy car can't, <laughs> doesn't have the sensors to, to, to tell you more about it than it's a vulnerable road user, does this crappier car then also have the bandwidth to give you the, the fidelity of sensor information for you to determine that it's a bike as opposed to a, a jogger? And yes, why? millimeter wave, yes. And, and, but I that's possible. The, the timelines uh, for millimeter wave deployment could be different than, than sensor deployment. On a rural road? Sorry? Rural road? I mean, if, I if, didn't get it. If, if, if you're a... Apache helicopter pilot and you want to get 
information on what, what, what the drone cooperating with you is seeing, and you need to know if they're civilians or, or not. Sure, stream the sensor data, but does, but does my, you know, Ford Fiesta need to, need to stream high bandwidth data to, to, to your Lexus so you can tell whether it's a red or a green bike or whether it's a jogger or, a, or, or, or somebody walking. I mean, vulnerable road user at this location, when you get into range of it, you can sense them for yourself. I, I just don't see the, the importance of, of streaming. Jeff, I'll data. tell you that I was also initially skeptical, but I've come to Jesus. And <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, and Robert has won me over, so you might might want to marinate I, on it for and, a while. And, and let me just let me just say, I'm speaking as Jeff Waters. I'm. This is not an NXP official <laughs> position on any of this stuff, right? Let's let Chris weigh in. He's been yeah. wanting to. Well, I think there's a simple example of a car that uh, skids on ice. You know, the electronic stability control is engaged. That information could be shared through the cloud to oncoming vehicles, maybe a mile back. Sure. That, that's low rate data. That's, that's, yeah, that's low rate, but the principle of sharing sensor data is still valid in that case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, TomTom Tom, uh, uses map data that's crowdsourced, True. and they basically have a way of uh, vetting the reliability of that information by caring, comparing it to other sources. And so they begin to get a ranking or give a rating to each of those vehicles. Yeah. If you can send along the data and a measurement model, a statistical model to characterize the data, then the receiving unit can, um, can treat it appropriately, yeah. even if it's 10 years difference between the two vehicles. Right. Other thoughts? Uh, you, sir. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is more of a business model question. I think I can get my head around return on investment for putting an onboard unit in a, in a vehicle for an automaker. Um, what I struggle with a little bit more is uh, how do you get your return on investment on the roadside units? Um, so who's going to pay for the infrastructure? Um, Obviously, there's other technologies like roadside reading and things like that. But a lot of this conversation about um, you know infrastructure at, at big stoplights depends on there being sensors in places, and it's not really clear to me how we would um, fund that kind of activity. And certainly, in Columbus, you've got a big grant to build some of that out, but that's not the case everywhere. How does that work? It's a great question. Yeah. Who funds the infrastructure? Is it a government? Is it a private uh, corporation that funds the infrastructure? Ideas, gentlemen? I think there are some business models that uh, that could allow for a little bit of bartering. You know, if we're going to put a if we're going to put a, a 5G uh, small cell every hundred meters, what what else do we have every hundred meters in a city? You know, a traffic light. So I I, I think there there might be some overlap there in terms of swapping. Uh, um, access to fiber and electricity in, in return for, for traffic services. But ultimately, the, you know, that, like I said, that's barter. The, the, who owns the roads? The municipalities over, own the roads in most cases, so they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to come up with the money to do it. Um, if you've gotta make a business case that the technology is cheaper than pouring more concrete. I think it's an excellent idea, Jeff, and in fact, I was in discussion with Texas Department of Transportation on the same thing. And they told me that uh, you know, AT&D, Verizon, and others are coming to them saying, you have the right of way. It's absolutely precious. We would be willing to do whatever it takes yeah. to get access to these, yeah. uh, the, these spots. And if that whatever it takes is, well, set up a DSRC receiver or set up some other uh, infrastructure that can talk to the vehicles, I, I think you'd have a business case yeah. there. Yep. I've got a question for the panel. So getting back to a, a point that Jeff, Jeff Andrews made about how we're going to wait 30 years for, uh, for, for a significant penetration um, of, of a technology, and, and Gaurav, your, your answer was that uh, safety is, is so important. I think that relates to the psychology of the automobile having to be so safe, but there are other movers that, and other players that, were, that are not tied to that. And for example, Dave's testimony that uh, it would be useful to have uh, to have a notification like that, that could be on my phone, and I'd be happy to install that. And I think we've seen instances of this. Are there, are there, is it perhaps not going to be the automotive industry that's going to make the first important inroads in, in these uh, technologies? So, uh, like, especially related to uh, the vehicle to vehicle communications uh, part of it, I think there are some, some work on maybe camera side where uh, you can buy off the shelf like a mobile eye camera, and that can give you warnings on where, whether you're departing the lanes. 
But uh, as far as communications uh, is, uh, is concerned, I think there are two things. One, uh, OEMs have done testing, and we believe that the sensors that you have in the smartphone, at least right now, they are maybe not as good as what you can have in the vehicle. And you can interface with the CAN bus. You can get a more precise you know, speed, steering wheel, uh, heading, all, all those information. Uh, I think that's, that's one aspect for, of it. And then the second thing is uh, perhaps, uh, like, you know, as an as a auto OEM, we have, you know, maybe we have less incentive on, you know, giving this thing away. This is kind of something for our driver, and, and we kind of want to do it, you know, for them. Uh, with, with the smartphone, I don't know, maybe would it be required to, uh, like, you know, have your smartphone positioned in a certain way, then that's how the driver is getting the warning. So that, that could maybe potentially introduce some kind of liabilities for us. If we build the system, like, you know, we know what it's doing, what kind of sensors uh, it's using, and, and then we can be kind of responsible for it. And, and, and I think just one thing I want to clarify to, to the point that Jeff made earlier. So, so right now the focus is on trying to deploy these 802.11p system. That's kind of the, the fight that auto industry is fighting with the government. But it doesn't mean that you know, we can update these standards. Like Wi-Fi has evolved so much. Uh, now we are at 11 AC. So once like, you know, the mandate is in place, two years from now, we might be working on like, you know, P2, P3, and, and that can involve the data rate, uh, latency, things. Do you plan on updating your existing fleet of vehicles? Do you plan on keeping cars that have been on the, on, on the, year, on, on the road 10 years? Can, can we refresh their uh, protocol? So, yeah, so there are some, some ideas on that. We do think that the, the cars have a length or, or a, you know, they, they are on the road 10 years on an average. So perhaps, but we all go to, you know, to our uh, dealers for updating, like, you know, things in our car, like oil change and stuff. So perhaps the dealership would evolve that, you know, every year maybe they'll update my software. Perhaps they will update my hardware. And, and that's one avenue of, of making these changes. Or over the air if the dealership is or, Tesla. Or over the air. <laughs> Go ahead, Gus. Is that you? Yeah. In the aggregation of all these systems to be safety of vehicle, what's the availability, the minimum availability of this aggregated network? Is it going to have to be better than GPS on its own? And is it going to go 2% blocking of 5G? Is it going to be what to make this a really effective safety system? And this is availability of V to V and V to I, or are you yes. thinking of one oh, of them? In kind of the how do those play into the aggregated needed availability? So if 2% of the time I can't get connectivity with any vehicle or any infrastructure, uh, what, what are the problems associated with that? Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, I guess if I'm going to live with 5% B to B availability, do I kill 1,000 people a year? <laughs> that was rather blunt. Uh, well, it does put a sharp, uh, sharp point on the question. <laughs> so right now we have 0% B to B, and I think 100 people die every day just in U.S. Uh, on car accidents. So, but I think if, if I'm understanding the question right, one way to think about it is, you can get benefits only if two cars in the world you know, had DSRC. But those benefits will come only when these two cars were possibly colliding with each other. So, uh, and, and I think there are some studies done on, on, on what kind of, at what kind of penetration values we would see decrease in this you know, 100 people dying every day in car accidents. And, and, and I don't remember maybe exactly, but from top of my head, I want to say somewhere between 10 to 20%. Yeah. That, that's where you will start seeing uh, benefits already. I don't, I don't think people buy features because they, they read a study generally. I mean, what it's really going to take to, to get the, to incentivize the market penetration, it, it, following the, the avionics example where you know, next generation air traffic control required the air, airlines to add equipment to their planes. It's like, I don't want to add a million dollars of equipment to each plane. That's expensive. We'll give you preferential landing slots. Oh, okay. The, the, so there's this principle in the modernization of air traffic control that the best equipped are the best served. If there's infrastructure in place that allows your well-equipped, well-communicating, trustworthy vehicle to 
treat every traffic light as if it's green or at least flashing yellow because this, you know, speed up, slow down, we're going to get you through this intersection with some priority. Suddenly people say, whoa, that would have a noticeable impact on my commute. I want a car that has that capability. I want to be in that best equipped, best served vehicle. So I think the, I think the real dynamic here is going to be get the infrastructure it, it, it is chicken and egg, but I, I don't think it's going to be cars talking to cars that it's going to really pull this technology forward. It's going to be the presence of more infrastructure to give the more infrastructure and infrastructure that will give the connected vehicles preferential treatment that would really accelerate the rollout. Well, I think in a, in a purely market driven economy, that would be correct. But if it's mandated, that's different. Well, the mandate would solve a lot of problems. <laughs> I can just read the front page of the New York Times now saying Jeff Waters recommends that only the rich get to go through the, uh, <laughs> the downtown. Driving Not just Lexus lanes, Lexus intersections. Now. <laughs> I was just, oh, sorry, I was just going to add, um, we're seeing some infrastructure examples today already uh, driving the fixed portions of opportunities for V2X. Uh, some of the smart cities programs underway, for example, GE and Intel were showing uh, a smart light that's not only a light, it obviously has a backhaul, it has the connectivity, it also has integrated cameras, it has positioning systems, so it can provide visual data for processing, it can provide references to vehicles if they are so equipped down the road. Um, and even in the smart home space, another mover economically to an earlier question is the insurance industry. We're, we are seeing, as an example, discounts to homeowners, not only for security systems, but actually to put proactive instrumentation and IoT in their home, uh, water meter, uh, water leak detection systems with active servo systems. Uh, you know, it costs the insurance industry billions of dollars every year for water loss write-offs, okay? So there's a clear economic value that can drive some of those fixed points that we can start to build the infrastructure around yeah. as well. It'd be interesting to see if the insurance industry promotes connectivity, if they get behind it in a big way. There was a question. Yeah, Jeff, I just want to make a point that uh, there's been a lot of questions around upgradability of uh, tech technology. One thing we've already done at Qualcomm is uh, our latest module, when we're in most of the cars, is upgradable. It's been designed in a way that you can swap out the board to upgrade it to the next generation, say when 5G chips comes along. So we're already starting to do that. So there is that part of the equation to consider. Is NXP looking along those lines too? Or do you think that's well ridiculous? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm developing a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the part that's in the car, the, the OBU, you know, the, I mean, there's even going to be aftermarket OBUs. So you can, if, if you're just talking about adding, adding the ability to receive messages and for the traffic light to tell you, you don't have to, 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 to buy the best car. You can, you can just plug in a new OBU into your, into your CAN connector. So, yeah, it's, it's upgradable, and I don't know that you necessarily have to, have to do something at the board level. I mean, it's that up, upgradability there should not be a problem. Back here. Yeah, question about liability. You mentioned insurance. I guess, how do you see this affecting decisions about who is liable in a crash, for example? I mean, is it the sensor manufacturer? Is it the OEM? Is it the driver? I think that's that, that's what's holding everyone back, right? Um, you know, as, as Google says, is when do we when do we push the button? When when do we just turn these things loose? And they, I I think they and anyone else would like to would like a standard against which they could certify and say I met this, therefore, I'm, you know, my my liability is contained in some way. Um, I, I guess I'll jump back. You know, I, I, I had really the same kind of question. I was uh, at the uh, Ann Arbor University of Michigan Mobility Transformation Center conference last November and uh, kind of had this, this, this very same question. And there was, um, there was a lady there from State Farm uh, and she said, oh, we're, the insurance companies are, are totally on board with this because most crashes are normal. And if we can 
80 percent of these things, 90 percent of these things, it's it's very common. Rear end, somebody backed into somebody else in a parking lot. So many of these things are so easily attributable that whose sensors and what this and what that is not even not even going to be a question. It's just going to be you, he hit you. We've got the data. Here's the check. And if we can stop 50 percent of those crashes from occurring because we have these these systems, then that saves us a ton of money. The, so the insurance companies want to see these normal accidents go away. Now that leaves you with the trickier ones where, where these questions come in, but they're not waiting to figure out how the trickier ones will be resolved to say we want this technology. That's a good point. And, and if I can just uh, add on to, to this, so I think federal government uh, might also have a play, uh, might have a role to play here in setting up some uh, regulations or yeah. guidelines that uh, a car has to be like you know certify, especially before uh, like you know level four or level five. And, and, and something to keep in mind is that right now, like some companies are deploying these level two systems where a uh, human being or the driver is supposed to monitor, you know, at all times. So uh, I think it's very clear that the responsibility also uh, or falls on the driver to be able to monitor uh, if, if in case if some crash happens. As is the case, usually the buck stops with the driver. Well, we'll thank our panel again once before uh, for, for lunchtime. It was a great discussion. We're going on to lunch now. It's uh, 1230. We need to be back here by 120 for the afternoon panel or afternoon keynote presentation. So don't loiter too much at lunch, but I think you'll enjoy it. We've got Whole Foods down on the first level. Same here. Nice meeting you.